We are tracking developments this hour on yesterday's plane crash in Iran. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau now saying there is evidence to suggest the plane was hit by a missile. Flight 752 was a Ukrainian Airlines passenger plane. It was carrying 176 people, including 63 Canadians. Also on board, 82 Iranians, 11 Ukrainians, 10 Swedes, 4 Afghans, 3 Brits and 3 Germans. 138 of the victims were headed to Canada, connecting in Kyiv. Canadians have questions and they deserve answers. The Boeing 737 departed Tehran's airport at 6.12 a.m. local time. Tracking data suggests the plane climbed to just over 2,400 meters, reaching a speed of 500 kilometers an hour. But three minutes into the four-hour flight, something went terribly wrong. The plane disappeared from radar, and video appears to show its fiery dive before crashing near a soccer field and exploding on impact at about 6.15 a.m. We want to also show you some brand new video that surfaced purporting to show the missile hitting the airliner. The video has been verif verified rather by the New York Times. It appears to capture the missile launching into the sky and striking the plane near Tehran's airport. The plane doesn't explode right away. It continues to fly ablaze, eventually turning back towards the airport. Under international civil aviation organization rules, Canadian crash investigators should be allowed to travel to Iran. But that does not mean they will be given direct access to the crash site. So what should Canadians be watching for as this investigation moves forward? Michael Bosercue is a global affairs analyst and a former spokesman for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. He was involved in the oversight of the investigation of the MH17 crash over Ukraine in 2014 and joins us now from New York. And Mary Schiavo is a former U.S. Department of Transportation Inspector General. She joins us from Charleston, South Carolina. Hi to both of you. Thanks very much for sharing some of your time this evening with us. I appreciate it. Michael, why don't I start with you? Are you surprised uh, by the information that the, that the plane or the evidence that we're hearing now that the plane was uh, brought down by a missile and potentially by mistake? I'm shocked, but not very surprised. I mean, the way the uh, plane came down very suddenly indicated a catastrophic incident and also the spread of the debris on the ground. Um, I, I think um, by the day almost the parallels with MH17 are becoming very, very much tighter. Um, don't forget that we're, the, both airplanes were flying in basically what is a conflict zone. Um, in the case of Malaysia Airlines, it was um, slightly above the closed airspace. The Ukrainians did not close the airspace entirely. And then here, um, I think, Vashi, if we should have learned anything from MH17 crash and the other crashes near conflict zones, is that there's no way that airplane should have been flying there whatsoever. Other airlines canceled their flights um, two, three, four days before, knowing that the risk level was very high. So that, to me, indicated that um, the risk was very high. One more thing. Look, um, I hope that... Um, given what's come out right now, is the Iranians do step up to the plate and open up the investigation to everyone. Actually, these were non-combatants in that plane. These were innocent men, women, and children. And the Iranians need to recognize that and uh, uh, allow very wide access, including for Canadian experts. Yeah, I want to delve into the potential for investigation in a second. But, Mary, I also want to ask you this, this point that Michael brought up around why the plane was flying at all. That's something that's stuck out to me just as someone with no expertise in the area. But given uh, the fact that we had just been covering the, the missiles that had been launched into Iraq, did it surprise you that this plane was even permitted to take off at all? Yes, and I think that's one of the big questions that the investigation will have to answer. Uh, what was the air, civilian air traffic control advised? When did they have the hold on the takeoff of the flight because this flight was delayed? Um, how did they coordinate between the military, the military advisors and radar? Who gave the all clear for the planes to be allowed to take off? And did air traffic, civilian air traffic control in the airport inform then the military that they had gone ahead and allowed aircraft to start taking off? The plane would not have taken off without 
without clearance from control. That just doesn't happen. And commercial aircraft, passenger aircraft, have to be under positive air traffic control. So there are a lot of questions to be answered on the ground, looking at the military radar, looking at the air traffic control tapes, as to how this could have been allowed to proceed without careful warning on both sides. But I agree with Michael. No plane should have been operating during this time, even if air traffic control said, OK, you can go. Let me just quickly follow up with you, Mary, and ask, based on the information that you had heard about this crash up until this morning, when you heard the reporting that the intelligence was showing that it had been shot down or that it was highly likely that it had been shot down, was that in line with what you had expected? Yes. Yes, it, it wasn't surprised, obviously terribly, you know, saddened. Um, and it does appear uh, to be ha been a terrible mistake. But the, the reason I wasn't surprised is because there was no evidence that you typically see in any kind of an aircraft malfunction. We had no mayday call. The uh, uh, radar tape showed the aircraft was climbing, gaining gaining altitude, it had a, a commensurate airspeed, was performing exactly as it should. The uh, Ukrainians were very quick when Iran said it was an aircraft malfunction to say, no, uh, we're not so sure and we want an investigation, which suggests to me that they had ACARS data, which is automated reporting data from the plane. It's a very new plane. It has ACARS. And it will actually tell the airline, it's used for troubleshooting purposes, whether the plane is experiencing difficulties with some of its major systems. So there just was no evidence of plane malfunction. Uh, Michael, let's let's delve into what the investigation might look like. Can you help us understand, given the circumstances, and I know each one obviously has its own individual set of circumstances, mm -hmm. but given the, the set of circumstances we understand there to be, what might be happening on the ground right now? Sure. Well, um, as you indicated earlier, I think, is that there could be the possibility of tampering with the evidence. Uh, from the images and video I've seen, it seems like, again, with MH17, there was very little perimeter security. And that's one of the first things uh, you establish. Of course, the second thing that immediately has to happen is the bodies need to be, of course, recovered and handled with dignity. And um, I don't um, actually want to get into many uh, details here because probably relatives are watching, but um, we also have to keep in mind that uh, this was a plane probably fully loaded with fuel, and um, when it crashed to the ground, there could have been um, quite a bit of flame, so that could um, complicate the, the body recovery. Uh, and then thirdly, um, as I indicated earlier, I, you know, these, uh, these types of investigations, I'm sure Mary agrees, is that they're very complex. They require a lot of different types of expertise. I understand that the black boxes are severely damaged, so hence even more, um, uh, I think, responsibility on behalf of the, um, the government, the Iranian government, to invite, for example, Canadian expertise so that they can analyze these boxes properly. I think at the end of the day, it behooves the authorities on the ground there to, again, open it up to international scrutiny that uh, there are no accusations later on of a bungled, uh, manipulated or whitewashed uh, investigation. Mary, what do you think the likelihood of the Iranians opening up this investigation is? I think it gets better as the days go by. You know, in the United States, when you do it, you have to have all parties present, even if they're not participating in the handling of the evidence, to observe it. And you can't do anything in the evidence chain without allowing the, all of the, the various parties to observe. So I think, given that they have already warned that the black boxes have been damaged, it would certainly be in their interest to invite the Canadian uh, TSB, as well as possibly other countries, in to observe the actual downloading of the data. They say they're in the progress of doing that now, so it appears that hasn't been done. But if they're, for some reason they can't get that data downloaded, then it will be suspect again. And, and you know, the, the black boxes are truly amazing in their resiliency. And in this plane, given it's so new, only four years old, there will be over a thousand different lines of code to help unravel how the plane was performing. It may not really say anything about a missile, but it will rule in or out any plane malfunction. And let me just, again, quickly follow up with you, Mary. How, how again, each investigation is different, but based on what you've heard so far and what you just mentioned, how long of an investigation do you think something like this might be? Well, it could take a very long time, but in reality, as Michael mentioned, the, the pieces of wreckage and the, the and the human remains contain a wealth of information. Most importantly, uh, explosive residue. The explosive pattern and the uh, the chemical components of jet fuel, as uh, aircraft fuel, is not the same as explosives. And as he mentioned in his work on MH17, you can determine that from not only the the wreckage itself, but the, but the human remains. I'm 
sorry to have to mention that, but it's very important how they perform the work uh, in that regard, too, with the autopsies. And so that could reveal answers almost immediately. And of course, there's one more thing, and that is the military radar. That's going to be hugely important if they choose to share it. Most countries say that it's national security and they don't want to share it, but that would give the answers very readily. Michael, I just have a few seconds left, but I want to know what you're looking for in the next 24 or 48 hours. Sure. Well, um, yeah, that was a great point about the radar data, uh, is that um, in the case of MH17, the Russians still, to this day, five years later, have not turned over primary radar, radar data. So that has created problems. And then um, perhaps the expertise that was developed because of the similarity between the two crashes, perhaps expertise from the Dutch and other parties to that particular investigation could be used in, the, in this one, particularly those who do not have a spat or have with Iran or have diplomatic relations. That could elevate, I think, the standard of the investigation. OK, I'll leave it there. I really want to thank both of you for your time this evening. Thanks to Michael BoserQ and Mary Schiavo. Does Canada have any legal right to pursue the investigation further? Jessica Davis is a former strategic analyst with CSIS, Canada's spy agency. She's now president of Insight Threat Intelligence. Leah West is a former national security lawyer in the Department of Justice. She's now a lecturer of national security and intelligence at Carleton University's Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. Hi, both of you. Nice to see you. Thanks very much for coming in for this. Jessica, I want to start with you because I want to circle back to what David was talking about at the beginning, and that is where the intelligence of all of informing what we heard from the Prime Minister comes from. So what we knew early on in the day is that that intelligence was primarily coming from south of the border and that it showed that it was highly likely that the plane was shot down. What kind of intelligence are we talking about? So highly likely is a very specific term, uh, particularly in the United States intelligence community, that signifies a high level of confidence in the intelligence that's being presented. So this is the kind of thing that we see only when you have multiple corroborating sources. Um, and it's really as strong as language in the business gets because there's always a level of uncertainty. We're dealing with intelligence here, not facts. So we don't generally see language that's stronger than this. So to me, this signifies that we have a lot of either independent corroborating sources or a few really, really strong ones. And the prime minister really signaled something to me today when, with what he was saying. And he said that there was American intelligence, but there was also Canadian intelligence. And to me, this is absolutely critical because in the context of what we're talking about now in a very um, tense political situation, there would be a concern that the Americans could be politicizing this kind of intelligence. So using um, intelligence inappropriately to bolster a political position. Because we have this independent Canadian intelligence, to me this lends a lot more credibility um, to this assessment. What did you draw, Leah, from the Prime Minister's comments where the evidence is concerned? Um, my assessment is very similar to Jessica's and even less informed than hers, but um, simply that he he believes, it, it's very clear to anyone watching that, that he believes that this is what happened. Um, but they're not in a position where they can fully corroborate that um, and that they, I think they want to give the opportunity to um, to get on the ground and have a role in the investigation. If you come out immediately and point fingers, the, uh, the, capa the idea that Iran would welcome Canadian officials into the investigation um, on, into Iranian soil um, would probably be pretty nil. Let me follow up with you and just ask you about that investigation mm -hmm. and what you know about the, the way in which these types of investigations take place. Uh, how might it in this kind of, and I know it's hard to know specifically in this case because each one is different, but in this type of a plane crash, how might those investigations take place? So there needs to be two investigations, actually. So um, we heard from the Prime Minister and others talking about the need for a credible investigation, and that's true. There needs to be a credible aviation security investigation, and that's what's required under international law under the Convention of International Civ um, for International Civil Aviation. So that's one thing, but it's very clear in the regulations around that act that that investigation is about aviation security. If you're trying to investigate criminal culpability or state responsibility for an action like this, that is a separate investigation. So anything that would lead to potential criminal charges or um, a judicial action would be a separate investigation. Um, and when we saw the MH17 crash, for example, the one uh, the crash that uh, took off from Amsterdam flying to Kuala Lumpur that. Uh, crashed in Ukraine, the Dutch took over responsibility for two separate investigations. One, the aviation um, 
um, investigation that actually concluded quite a bit earlier than the criminal investigation, which concluded several years later. So in layman's terms, just so that I understand and for our viewers understand, basically the one investigation is like around plane safety and the mechanics of the plane. The other is who's to blame, exactly. what's to blame, right? Precisely. Okay. And uh, Jess, when you are thinking towards the investigation aspects or the investigations that might or should take place, this idea of a credible one, uh, the, the Prime Minister kept using the word credible. We're dealing with an actor here, Iran, that's in the midst of you know, one of the most tense periods of its history with the United States. Uh, is there any incentive for them to welcome Canadian investigators in any capacity? I don't think so. I think in this instance, especially if what the Prime Minister suggests happened, happened, um, they're going to want to keep investigators out. They're going to want to prevent people from really finding out the truth about what happened because it looks terrible on them. Um, this is an incredible loss of life of Iranian citizens, of Canadian citizens. So for both countries, this is really terrible. Um, and they look really bad internationally. Um, so I think that they're going to try to politicize the investigation as much as they can, try to obfuscate the investigation. But I think that they're going to be unsuccessful ultimately because when we make a comparison like Leo was doing to MH17, Despite all of the Russian efforts to stymie that investigation, we ended up learning a lot about what happened, um, in part because of the Dutch investigation, but also because of open source investigators like Bellingcat. So I have a lot more confidence that we're eventually going to get to the truth of what happened. Uh, can I just yeah. interrupt for a second? What are open, can you explain for us like what those types of open source investigators yes. are? Because so I, there's I like, don't know if everyone is yeah, there's aware. These, yeah. There's a, um, a cadre now of people who work entirely off off open source intelligence, basically. So imagery, um, tips from the public, other kinds of publicly available information to piece these things together. This is the kind of intelligence and information that wasn't available 20 years ago. It was inconceivable that you could conduct these kind of investigations without access to classified intelligence. Now, it's not only possible, but it's of high credibility when it happens. Uh, uh, Leah, David was highlighting the fact that the Prime Minister uh, said that there seemed to be some kind of openness to Canadians coming, but we really know nothing about the willingness of the Iranians to let Canadians in in a, in a, in a bigger capacity or to right. participate in the investigation. Does Canada have any legal rights where this stuff is concerned? And if so, what are they? So what David was talking about is level one access. That would That is what is legally required in a situation like this. So where a state has a special incident in an accident because of the significant amount of casualties it has in connection with the crash, then it has the right to have appoint an expert to visit the accident, have access to information that the investigating state wants to reveal, and eventually get a copy of the final report. But in terms of getting more, um, more complete access to conduct its own separate investigation, there's no legal requirement for that. Again, Iran is a sovereign state and it controls um, the investigation inside of its territory, so it's really up to Iran. Unless there's some sort of call on, for example, the United Nations Security Council, which is what we saw again after MH17, there was a resolution brought forward and passed to allow for full investigation. Um, that's something that could happen. But does that actually change anything legally or does that just up the pressure? It would significantly up the pressure. Um, but then again, um, actually getting on the ground, getting access is going to be within Iran's control unless um, some allies can work on Canadians' behalf to facilitate that access. What about, let's pretend the investigation concludes in some fashion, the outcome is nuanced, I don't know what it says, but it ultimately determines that yes, the plane was shot down in Iran to some degree is culpable. What recourse is there for Canada? What options are available to this country, Jessica? Canada doesn't have a lot of options right now. Um, we have very limited diplomatic relations with Iran. So really what we're looking at is potentially engaging in more sanctions against Iran, but that leaves us holding the bag in terms of enforcement, which is a whole other issue about this sanctions enforcement in this country. The other option that we have is to crack down on Hezbollah activity here in Canada. So Hezbollah is a terrorist organization that's funded by Iran, and in 2018, FinTrack came out and said that they have a financing and facilitation network here. So we can up the ante against that network, but it's not going to have direct impact on the Iranian regime. So ultimately, we're 
where we are is in a position of having potentially very good intelligence, all of the answers to our intelligence questions, and very few options. Leo, same question to you really quickly before we go. There's options a couple that you of see? international uh, law uh, options. You could take Iran, Canada could take Iran to the International Court of Justice. Iran did the exact same thing to the United States when the U.S. downed a civilian airliner in 1998, 1988, and that led to uh, the United States taking some responsibility and p paying a monetary sum to Iran uh, in record as recourse for that. Um, realistically here, there's several international obligations that Iran may have violated uh, if all this bears out um, that Canada could seek to enforce at the ICJ. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much to both of you for your insights seeming really helpful. Thanks to Jessica Davis, president of Insight Threat Intelligence, and Leah West with the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. <music> Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.